Yes, via telephone, the Attorney General of the State of West Virginia, Patrick Morrissey, joins us now. Patrick, good morning to you. Good morning, gentlemen. I hope things are going well. It's a great new year, and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys up in the eastern panhandle soon. Are you uh, safely uh, tucked away inside of a building at this time? I am safely tucked away, <laughs> undisclosed location. <laughs> I am down in Charleston, and uh, things are going well. Although I will mention to your audience, I will be up in the eastern panhandle. I will be back home, and it will be on Friday. I'm coming to a, a meeting in the, I think it's in Martinsburg, Eastern Panhandle Business Association. So I'm looking forward to getting back home for the weekend. Did you file your official papers yesterday, Patrick? No, we're looking at next week. Uh, yesterday we filed our an updated campaign finance report, uh, but we're timing it for next week. We actually have a lot going on in the office this week. And then I have to head up to the panhandle. So we thought we'd time it for next week. After you get a couple people out of the way, you're going to file early. And I think that'll work. The timing will work just right. Did you watch the uh, national championship game last night, Michigan and Washington? Uh, just a little bit of it. Uh, so I think that uh, Michigan clearly had a heck of a good year. So they were they were dominant. And I'll be curious if Harbaugh stays yeah. uh, for another year after the craziness that was this college football season. So, but they uh, they look pretty good. I coach high school football at a school called Oakdale in in uh, in Maryland, and we won the three A state championship this year. Went fourteen and zero. So okay. we we had this defensive end named Dominic Nichols who got a full scholarship to uh, Michigan to play football there, and they uh, early enrolled him. So the day after Christmas, he left for Ann Arbor, and they took him to the Rose Bowl last week, gave him a, a jersey, can't, you know, no pads, he can't play, uh, and then took him to the national championship game last night. And I'm thinking, that's a pretty good five-week stretch. You go, you go from state champions to national champions in, in five weeks. It's kind of tough to top that uh, at the age of 18, Patrick. Well, there's no doubt about that. I, I thought it was an interesting a year, obviously with the controversy of Florida State going undefeated and being left out. Uh, but now you move in the future to the 12-team playoff. That's going to be a little bit wild. But I think there was no doubt Michigan was the best team in college football this year. It would have been really interesting to see if Georgia had made the playoffs mm -hmm. because I still think they were an incredible team. They got left out, deservedly so, because they lost, lost to Alabama at the end. But uh, maybe next year, West Virginia, uh, a lot of the early – prognosticators are putting them in the preseason top 25 and i think they've done pretty well in the transfer portal so we'll see how that goes on but uh, there is some optimism in mountaineerland well with the way that uh, some of the more powerful teams are moving from conference to conference it kind of clears the way for teams like west virginia to maybe get a shot at a top 12 post because you figure your conference is going to be a little bit easier now well, it's also a different a different environment now, right, with uh, the portal changing. I actually think one of the issues that comes out of the NCAA suit that we filed and where we earned the temporary restraining order and the preliminary injunction is that the NCAA is going to generally look to redo a lot of the transfer rules to make them more fair, to bring more clarity to the system, at least so people and schools are going to have some predictability as to what will happen, because right now it's chaos. And you don't want that. And I'll be curious as to how the NCAA redoes its transfer rules after we were able to obtain our TRO in the court with the Raekwon battle issue. We started to hear about the NCAA getting together and talking about changing its transfer policies. So that will be interesting because undoubtedly it's going to apply not only to basketball, to football, but to all sports. And so it's important that they follow the rules. And I think that there's some predictability and certainty as for the athletes. These are supposed to be student athletes, after all, and they deserve a little bit more certainty than what they've been provided over the years. What is the status of that temporary restraining order? Or <laughs> well, as you guys called? know, uh, for Raekwon Battle and Noah Farrakhan and probably about 100 different athletes, it was extended out to the end of the spring season. So they actually, the NCAA cannot begin to make changes or, or fight that in a way that would at least affect Raekwon or Noah until the last day of the 
basketball season. So that means that uh, Raekwon and Noah get to play without fear of playing a few games and risking losing their year of eligibility in an unintended way. So I think that we'll start to hear a lot more about that. You'll start to get into broader litigation sometime in April. We did an interview with that shortly after it happened, and I remember you saying that the provisions were such that they could play at no risk. The school would not, should the courts reverse this later, be held responsible and therefore have to forfeit games. Uh, However, right after our interview, I heard several uh, national pundits and talking heads in sports, uh, those pretty big names too, talking about that double jeopardy. And I thought, that's not what Patrick just said. Were those folks misinformed, or was there some possible way that the schools could have gotten in trouble for playing those kids? Yeah, so here's what happened. This is actually why it was so interesting. We were able to get the temporary restraining order, and then the judge in that order indicated that he did not want the schools to be penalized. He didn't want the athletes to be penalized. So Later on that day and into the next day after we got the TRO, probably after I came on your show, you started to see the NCAA clarify that if an athlete were to pursue eligibility and the case was reversed at a December 27th hearing, then the student athlete would risk that eligibility. But we thought that was completely counter to the messaging from the court. So, and then I was on that day on the Pat McAfee show uh, on ESPN, and we talked a lot about that and the problem and the potential pullback from the NCAA. <clears throat> and fortunately, I think for a lot of reasons, maybe including uh, being on that show and a couple other things going on, uh, the NCAA and the states were able to reach an agreement uh, thereafter that there would not be any penalty Uh, for that. And I think that was a real concern. And so that's what extended the injunction out until April. And I thought that was a terrific result because no one, at least the the states and the uh, the courts, did not want to put these athletes at risk. And I think the NCAA agreed with that as well. And I'm appreciative of that because there's no reason to have such uncertainty well, we're going to be in court soon enough to really get to the meat of these issues in April. Let's talk about this uh, opioid settlement money, uh, Patrick. It is a large amount of money, and there is some question as to whose job it is to oversee the appropriate use of this money. Can you clarify that? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a couple different buckets that are out there. Uh, one, about 24.5% of the dollars are going to the cities and the counties. Uh, directly. And in fact, I just partnered with the auditor, J.B. McCuskey, uh, on a project to uh, make sure that the cities and counties know the rules of the road in terms of how the monies need to be expended, uh, just that there were some purposes have to be related to opioids. The counties and cities do have broad discretion about how they're spending their money. That's what they had insisted as a result of the uh, litigation. And so I just partner with the auditor on some good rules of the road, uh, setting up a separate account and some other systems to make sure that there is tracking and there's accounting. And for that, uh, it's really kind of a combined oversight. Obviously, the auditor in the state has oversight over cities and county spending. And the attorney general, of course, has oversight over uh, compliance with settlements, which is what we have here with respect to the cities and counties so you know we just want to be helpful but that's why we partnered with the cities and counties because there's a natural entity uh i mean the auditor's office i should say there's a natural entity uh, that works with the cities and counties every day and this is meant to be smooth so i think that's very clear then separately you have the west virginia first foundation it's really the crown jewel of the efforts where uh, the bulk of the net settlement dollars go in, and that's a foundation, a board of 11 members, and uh, that's where the attorney general has direct oversight uh, over that. And we're obviously looking at that closely. We're uh, hoping that that uh, foundation is going to be able to do some pretty incredible things uh, for the state. But a lot of work is in front of that foundation, uh, and we're we're hopeful that. It's just getting off the ground now, but they'll be able to 
uh, get their team in place and we're going to proceed. So we've been uh, working to, to do everything we can to be helpful to them. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> I want to go to shift gears a little bit to the, um, I guess it's a petition that you, you participated in on, on appealing the Colorado case that takes Donald Trump off of the ballot. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So uh, many people listening know that there's been a broad effort to kick President Trump off the ballot. And these plaintiffs have cited uh, the 14th Amendment, Section 3, the Insurrection Clause. And they've argued that state officials have the ability to uh, determine whether President Trump can be on the ballot or not, whether we're talking about a state official in the form of the Secretary of State in Maine or court officials in Colorado. And many people listening know that Colorado, in a four to three decision, decided to disqualify President Trump. And that was actually done by the Colorado Supreme Court in a four to three decision. There were seven Democrat judges that made that decision. And so now of uh, this case goes before the high court. Uh, the Trump uh, campaign had petitioned uh, and assert to get up to the Supreme Court. We had weighed in. Uh, we actually uh, wrote a brief with, along with Indiana. We co-led with Indiana. Every single uh, Republican state in the country joined our brief, and we asked the court to take the case up and ultimately uh, to rule that uh, not only that President Trump uh, shouldn't be disqualified for the ballot, but that when you're dealing with this question of insurrection, that this is an issue that has to be dealt with at the federal level. Uh, because, number one, you're not going to get the due process in place on the state level. Think about what happened in Maine. Uh, think about what happened in these cases. You're not giving the candidate subject to the disqualification disqualification the opportunity to contest the matters, to call witnesses, to be given the kind of normal ability to collect evidence and really engage in a bona fide process where there's fairness, rules of fairness. And I think certainly people were very upset about what happened in Maine, where the Secretary of State just kind of blurted out uh, her finding. And I think there were some of the same problems that occurred in Colorado. But the arguments that we're going to be making is that this is really a federal determination. And the whole history and context of the 14th Amendment argues that if there's going to be a determination about insurrection, that has to be made by Congress. And we feel really good, good about the argument. It's actually bringing together a lot of people that are not even fans of President Trump, but I think that they understand that if you're going to have wildly uh, differing standards in terms of insurrection, that's a problem. There needs to be some standard. It shouldn't just be this vague uh, term. And there is real debate about uh, what the word means, what it was meant when it was written. I think a lot of that's going to come out in the Supreme Court. Uh, but to me, it seems clear that it should be a federally grounded decision. In other words, that's something that Congress would have to dictate. And that ties into some of the issues related to uh, impeachment and conviction. But at a minimum, Congress would have to step in and weigh in in order for uh, the court, presumably, to even weigh in on the matter. Is, is there a precedent you're aware of anywhere in the United States where somebody has been convicted of insurrection? per se, and, and what the situation was around it. Because as I look at it, <clears throat> insurrection is a word. So is demagoguery. So is, you know, there are a lot of, of words. But without a defined crime, it, it's, it's hard to sling it in, in, in such a meaningful way. So have, have there been insurrection convictions not involving Mr. Trump, but, but otherwise? Well, we have not seen anything in recent years. We've been going back through, obviously, the post-Civil War is when this was most uh, prevalent. And so maybe when I come on next, the oral argument's interestingly going to be on February 8th. We can kind of walk through some of the particulars and the examples or lack thereof. But it is important to point out that in all of the allegations against uh, Donald Trump, 
he's not being charged with insurrection. So just a, a point of fact for people that want to go ahead and knock him off the ballot. This should not be a political process. Courts are generally uh, asked and, and take umbrage if they were to be getting involved in a political activity. And whether someone's on the ballot or not, or whether the voter is going to be able to cast a ballot for that person is inherently a political activity. So uh, we have not seen anything in recent memory, but even more importantly, there really, uh, I, th- I think, there's not even the context of having uh, someone being charged for that specific crime, and I think that's critical. And how does West Virginia have legal standing in what Colorado is doing? In, in yeah, ter- so here's where we are. We're not a party, underlying party of the case. We're an amicus. We're a friend of the court. So we weighed in because we care about the interpretation of the court. And as people listening know, West Virginia were subject to the same challenge. So if this were to go up at the U.S. Supreme Court and it would be to resolve unfavorably, that would impact our case here in West Virginia. West Virginia at the first round has been able to say in the district court that uh, the provision does not apply. President Trump will remain on the ballot in West Virginia. But now this goes up to the Fourth Circuit. And so this will go through a separate process. So when things are going up before the high court, and you know your citizens have a great deal of interest in whether President Trump is on the ballot, that's why we weigh in. But we're not actually a party. We're a co-lead in a friend of the court brief. And that's traditional where you have people uh, who are outside who might not otherwise have standing to file a suit where they weigh in, if that makes sense. It, it does. And are you aware of similar filings on the other side of the case that are, are being sent you know, to the Supreme Court in support of it? There will be, there, there certainly will be uh, filings on the other side. The amicus briefs on the merits are due January 18th. And so I expect that there will be, we will file on the 18th, and then there will be uh, just probably dozens of different briefs that go in on the 18th as well, including uh, some other states who probably have a different perspective on this topic than I do and the other uh, the other states that are joining our brief. Will the results of this case before the Supremes give give final closure to whether or not Trump committed insurrection on January 6th? Or is that a different you case? Know, I- I would be surprised if that's the outcome, but uh, I think we're all going to have to wait patiently. One thing I have learned throughout uh, my career as attorney general is to never presuppose what a court will do. And you always go into a court with uh, humility and you're humble because they ultimately make the decision uh, that the advocates like myself and others argue about. So uh, I do think I'm hopeful that they're going to, have clarity to the process in terms of how the term is defined, uh, either that they don't weigh in or they conclude that they shouldn't weigh in or that there's some process that comes out. But uh, we don't know for certain what they will do, how they will rule. I'm obviously uh, hopeful that they will weigh in and agree with the positions we're bringing. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, our guest here on the program. You have taken some criticism in regards to outside counsel fees, Patrick, associated with your office. Can you address that? Yeah, this is great. So they're actually, this is probably one of the best stories and records of accomplishment that you're going to find. And there is a gentleman, uh, I use that term loosely, who has uh, put out material that's quite frankly just uh, wildly inaccurate in terms of the messaging. So many people may remember that uh, when I came in, you had an attorney general who not only used outside counsel a lot, but used to pay the outside counsel between 33% and 40% uh, in terms of the bottom line. I thought that was egregious. It was outrageous. And I promised when I got to be attorney general, I was going to step up and I was going to change that. That's exactly what I've done. And so uh, you can actually see, and and Rob, I don't know if you have a copy of the chart that we sent out, and maybe you can put it on the website for all of your listeners to see. It tells a remarkable story. 
of the cases that I inherited from my predecessor, because that happens, obviously, when you go from one office to another, the occupant of the office inherits a lot of the previous cases. There were a number of cases where the outside counsel, because they were hired by my predecessor, they were getting the 33 to 40 percent. We actually went in and argued against that fee level in every single instance. And in a number of cases, uh, the court just said, no, the, your predecessor hired it. He meant that usual and customary meant 33 to 40 percent, and we're going to honor that. Okay. And then there were a separate set of cases where the outside counsel decided, well, listen, uh, I think I'm entitled to 33 to 40 percent. That's what they'd say, but we're going to negotiate something with you. And in a number of those cases, as the chart made clear, that went down to 25 percent. Then you get to the cases um, based upon the policy that I wrote and that ultimately I brought to the legislature. And you know what the average outside counsel cost is? 8.4 percent. So we've saved so many tens of millions of dollars for West Virginia taxpayers. And that's the true story of what's happened. And you, you could see that in the chart. So there are some people, and once again, because politically they're opposed, this is just politics, by people that disagree uh, because they're with other people uh, electorally. They're trying to take it out and make facts up. But there are people that are arguing, well, wait a minute, there was just a large amount of money that was awarded in the recent opioid settlements, and that's true. But if you break it down, you see that about uh, – 40-some-odd million came in on the opioids for the state. In fact, the, one of the lowest settlements for outside counsel in the country, 7.76% for outside counsel for the best results, number one per capita in the country. So think about that, best results, lowest fees, but then the critique was leveled, well, wait a minute, the counties and cities are paying a lot more. Their fee ends up being probably close to over 25%. I objected to that strenuously. In fact, there's a long record of me objecting to that, but I don't control the counties and the cities. Uh, as much as we tried to get lower fees in that area, unfortunately, uh, the presiding uh, master and the court disagreed with me. I think that's something that should be changed uh, in court. But people were trying to wrongly lump in the amount of money that the counties and cities are getting as opposed to looking at the really great numbers that we put out. And this is an easy issue to discuss. It's not really a debate because I think the record's clear, but I think you have to look at the motivation, quite frankly, of a very conflicted individual who I don't think has much credibility. Do you have time for a follow-up question on outside counsel? Yeah, please okay. fire away. Uh, is it standard operating procedure for attorney general's office around the country to use outside counsel? And if so, why? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at that table that I do hope you put up for the public to see, uh, you'd see that we don't use outside counsel for uh, these consumer cases uh, at even one, a small percentage of the volume that my predecessor did. did. However, we do think that it could be very helpful when you have a really big case. And let me explain why. When you have a case like opioids, uh, there are two ways to do it. You can actually keep an army, a legion of lawyers in your office, and you'd require to spend many millions of dollars of a year if you have a really big enforcement matter. Uh, and then they're sitting around, what are they doing with their time? And they're spending taxpayer money. Or you can have outside counsel that you bring in for unique cases. So it might have been tobacco, it may be opioids, it may be the highways case. But there are select cases where you believe that based upon either the expertise that they bring to bear or simply the resources when you're going up against uh, these really big drug companies or you're going up against Facebook or Google, you have to work as a team. Otherwise, the state literally lacks any ability to enforce the law. So if you think about being the 38th, uh, largest state in the nation, you don't have 50 lawyers sitting around doing nothing. And so you'd have to bring in the outside counsel in select instances. I actually do it far less than most people in the country and far less than my predecessor. But I don't believe that you should eliminate that option 
because I do believe that the attorney general has a duty to enforce the law. And I'm not going to let some group that probably doesn't care much about enforcing the law uh, dictate what happens. Appreciate that, Patrick. And the final thought is yours if you had anything else you needed to get out there. Well, I, I actually am grateful you asked on the outside council. It's actually something that I'm really proud about for the office because we were able to do a lot more with less money. And we've done this from the very beginning. And it's wonderful when you have uh, something that you've done and it's it's an example for other states to see the lower outside council fees and what that means, how, how much money – taxpayers save the many, many millions of dollars that you can point to. So we try to run that the right way. If you do put the uh, chart up, that'd be great. And as I said, I'd be happy to take any questions. I'd also want to let people know if you want to meet with me in the office, uh, I will be up in the Eastern Panhandle and I will be uh, up in our uh, Attorney General office in Martinsburg uh, on Aiken Drive uh, Friday afternoon. So uh, Give a call or stop on by, and we'll probably have a little gathering up there. But I'm excited to be back home. I have the chart, Patrick, and we'll get it posted to our Facebook page so that our listeners and viewers can comb through it as detailed as they want. Uh, I didn't want to put it on the TV screen because I wasn't sure what the resolution would be uh, in regards to the sharpness. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot, lot of data, figures there. But, yeah, a lot of data. Yeah, but I, I think it makes the point pretty clear, and I think people should have the opportunity to look at it. And a lot of information is up on our website, so I think that people will see it's a really good record on outside counsel. Look, uh, everyone has plenty of flaws, myself included, but this is one where we really were able to do great work and achieve terrific results for the state at very low cost. And I think we should extend the principle out for the counties and cities. That'd be terrific. But, you know, look, for heaven's sake, you're going to – a guy wins the Super Bowl – and he wins by three touchdowns, and you're going to go after the guy saying, no, you should have actually won by eight touchdowns. That just doesn't make any sense. Gotcha. Still a Super Bowl champion either way, right? Hey, Amen. Well, guys, uh, thanks for your time, and uh, maybe we'll see you a little bit later in the week. Thank you, Patrick. Take have care. a great day.